can actually use to enhance the value of intra-Africa um, travel. But the biggest question really is how do we fully capitalize um, and take advantage when we're experiencing impediments, if you will, and of course in the tourism space, they, they term it bottlenecks, as it were, in uh, regional air connectivity. And of course our next panel discussion will be talking to that. It is a ministerial and executives hard talk um, that will be uh, speaking to ensuring affordable uh, uh, regional air connectivity. So that's a conversation that's coming. And of course, I'd like to welcome the moderator um, for this next talk. He's the CEO of Airline Association of Southern Africa, AASA for short, Mr. Aaron Munetzi. And of course, he will then uh, follow by um, calling on stage his panelists and just follow protocol in that regard. Uh, keep the time, and uh, as the audience, you are only allowed one question. So we'll be getting one question from either the virtual audience or the physical audience, and then respond to it in that regard. So 30 minutes for the discussion, and then 10 minutes for the Q&A. Thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the function last night was devastating. With that kind of response, hmm, let's try this again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. That's much better. Fellow Africans, how are you this morning? So, fellow Africans, I just want to find out... Uh, how passionate are you about being Africans? All right, okay, so a few questions for you. How many countries are in Africa? Mm -hmm. We're about to start a war here. 54, 55, 51, 52. Fellow Africans. Hey. 55. So what's the population of Africa, fellow Africans? Here we go. Fellow Africans, one click. How many are we in Africa? <laughs> Honorable Minister, so our fellow Africans actually don't even know how many we are on the continent. Fellow Africans, I'll make this easy for you. I'll make this easy for you, fellow Africans. So tell me, what language is most spoken on the continent? <laughs> Honorable Minister in the front here is actually laughing, you know. <laughs> I've asked these questions over and over again, and it's amazing how we, as fellow Africans, actually don't know that the, most, the language most spoken on the continent is French. Let me make it easier for you, fellow Africans. So the longest river on the continent is the Nile River. Yes. Clap your hands for yourselves. And the second longest river is? Congo, Orange, Zambezi. I think at this stage you're actually feeling uncomfortable being Africans, right? Because we're talking about aviation, right? So let's maybe finalize it with a very simple question, which I know all of you will stand up and say one answer. Fellow Africans, how many countries in Africa are landlocked? <laughs> Let me call to the stage. <laughs> uh, fellow Africans. <laughs> Fellow Africans, let me call to the stage. <laughs> you want to put something on me for the, for the presentation? Okay. All right. So, fellow Africans, maybe let me share with you um, a few perspectives about aviation on the continent before I call my panel. Uh, so, Chief, you gave me this thing. You want me to flick it? It's not flicking. So, what may I do now? Technology or digitalization. What is this now? 
So I just want to share with you one or two slides about how the African continent uh, is faring as far as uh, aviation is concerned. Who's going to help me here? I'm trying to get my presentation. It's on? I don't see it. All right, okay. I, I, I thought it was going to be here. Okay, all right. So here is what African economic performance looks like according to the World uh, Economic Forum. So um, growth varies widely across our countries and regions as far as, for example, Central Africa, 3.4%. Um, is projected to rise to 4.6% in 2022. Uh, North Africa seems to be doing quite well at 11%, but it, it's going to decelerate to about 4.5% in 2022. And East Africa at 4.5%, stabilizes at 4.7%. Southern Africa, uh, 6% is estimated growth of 4.2%, obviously because of there was a gross, uh, quite a lot of uh, strong recovery in Botswana, well done Botswana, uh, Mauritius, and South Africa. But why is this important? Um, this is important because it gives us a perspective of one thing. Um, GDP actually determines how, in most cases, travel develops. But let's put first things first. Why was I asking you those questions earlier on? I want you to know this, guys. So picture this. As Africa, 1.3 billion, that's the question that you asked you, you didn't know. 1.3 billion people, we are actually 15% of the world's population. 15%. Very significant. And unfortunately, we only contribute 2% of global traffic. 15% of the global population, we only contribute 2% of global traffic. And our share of intra-Africa traffic by, by non-African airlines has risen to 9%. So somebody is eating our lunch. Ask yourself this question. So the single Africa air transport market, Dr. Bauer spoke about it passionately yesterday. 35 signatories have signed since 2018. And I always say 35 number, this number of 35 is insignificant because it's like having a runway and not taking off. But 23 have since signed the memorandum of implementation. And the 20 that have not signed, we want to ask our questions, why not? But these 35 that have signed constitute 80% of the Africa travel market. 80%. So if you use the Pareto effect, 80-20 rule, these have contributed 80% are significant. We must make sure we don't lose them. And they are actually part of the 58 airlines on the African continent in, instituted in these, in, these, um, in, in these countries. And the significance is that they actually impact on the growth of airlines, the growth of airports, and so forth. Let me quote one of my favorite boxers, cha -cha -cha -cha. Mike Tyson. With all these things that we, are, that we are talking about, Mike Tyson said, if you've got a plan and you get into the boxing ring, once the first punch lands and your, um, your, 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 your tooth guard goes this way and your ears go that way, you are going to lose focus. What has hit us? Because end of the day, as Africans, we actually started this journey in 1988, long before the Europeans came up with the Euro, uh, European uh, uh, um, uh, Act. And look at where they are ahead of us. Does any one of you remember Air Africa? 41 years ago, these guys came together. 11 countries came together and formed Air Africa, way ahead of any global branded alliance. They were gone in 2001. Gone 41 years down the road. Now, think about it. The formation of Air, um, um, One World, Sky Team, uh, and Star Alliance actually comes from what Africans did. So don't disparage Africa. Africa came up with Yamasukru, came up with a Pan, uh, the Pan-African Airline Air Africa, the only challenge we have is that we have not been able to execute. So today we're going to talk about what is ailing us as Africans. 
Allow me then, ladies and gentlemen, to call upon the doyens of the industry. So I, I have a very interesting panel to talk to. Um, Honorable Minister, uh, Deputy Minister Fish uh, Mashasela is with us. Honorable Minister. Um, he is my favorite minister because I'm seeing him for the second time in a month. Honorable Minister, you remember we were in Sun City. I will not tell them that kind of a dance you and I did. <laughs> um, I, I'm also joined by the DG of the Botswana Civil Aviation Authority, Dr. Bao Mosini. Dr. Bao, please come over. Today, I am going to put you on this cure. You thought you were giving us a tough time yesterday? Come over here and you'll see what I'm going to do to you. But these are regulators, right? There is a practitioner amongst us, uh, a brother, a friend, and a colleague, a mentor, Roger Foster, CEO of Airlink. And last but not least, a young man that I admire, uh, a young man that gives me sleepless nights because I think he's trying to follow in my footsteps and I can see he's doing even better than I am doing. Mr. Sandilechi Punza, the manager of external affairs and sustainability for Africa and Middle East, Bayata. Uh, the Honorable Minister, or Deputy Minister of Natural Resources and Tourism from Tanzania, Honorable um, Mary Masanja. Is she with us? No? Uh, already you can see, Roger, this thing is not gender sensitive, right? <laughs> but we, 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 t we, had, we, we, uh, we tried. The Honorable Minister is not here with us today. So, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, so from your point of view, from a tourism point of view, how does this thing get together in terms of talking about the single Africa air transport market and tourism? And we are talking about sustainability here. What are, what are the challenges we are facing? What is making us not be the Africa that we want to be? Uh, no, th thank you very much. Uh, a program director, and uh, let me extend my my greetings to the Minister of Environment and Tourism uh, in Botswana, Deputy Ministers, uh, members that are here, CEOs of companies. W well, first and foremost, as as you'll recall, that um, uh, as you have said uh, okay. some years back. Okay. Uh, okay. If my memory serves me well, somewhere in 1999, uh, 44 countries adopted the Amasukru uh, decision, of which key amongst those was to make sure that uh, uh, we deal with the problem of protect protectionism on the aviation, aviation market by making sure that we create a liberalized a space market. That decision said we must create a, the the South African, uh, I mean the South African air uh, uh, traffic uh, 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 market, which will then enables to make sure that there's easy movement within the continent. Unfortunately, that didn't happen until, as you say, until 2018, where a few countries signed, and now at 20, we were, were sitting at 20. The challenges that we have is, is first and foremost, the high cost uh, of all air traveling, the problem of connectivity within the continent. Uh, some are arguing that the reason for, for that is because of a low demand, but there is an argument counter to that which has been proven scientifically that if you lower your air, tra your air traffic, 
I mean, your air traffic fares, you are increasing a possibility of more people traveling, and therefore you are increasing demand. And once you increase demand, you will then be able to reduce the price, but then will then increase your connectivity, and then you will then be able to make sure that there's more people who are traveling and the tourism as a result of that will be able to benefit. Fantastic. So, Roger, I can see you thinking to yourself, as Deputy Minister speaking, low airfares, as an airline operator from your side, um, is low airfares going to stimulate demand? Well, I think that... Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. I, I think that there are lots of scientific studies about market elasticity and um, one has to pay attention to a market which is inelastic and a lot of the markets between key points in Africa do not exhibit elasticity based on price. I think from an airline point of view and recognizing the importance of air access to tourism, one thing that we need to establish is sustainability and the airline industry, especially in southern Africa, has demonstrated that it was not sustainable. And that wasn't because of COVID. The unsustainability happened long before COVID. And we saw the imminence of the casualties that fell one after the other, at, catalyzed possibly by COVID. And I think what's very important for tourism is reliability, which has to be bankable. To get to reliability requires sustainable viability. Now, if we talk about the development of internodal transportation systems within Africa, such as that which has been envisioned by the single African air transportation market going back to Yamasukra in 1988 was the first declaration of Yamasukra. That declaration was about liberalization. I think what we've got to bear in mind is first and foremost comes the sustainable viability of an airline that can then develop new routes and provide access for tourism in all forms of tourism, visiting friends and relatives, inbound tourism from source markets all over the world, um, industrial business tourism, and so on. So for me, the key is let's first establish sustainable viability and reliability that follows on from that. Thank you. So, so Sandile, so uh, I don't know why they switch me on, but Sandile, so, so from, uh, from the International Air Transport Association point of view, Roger is talking about sustainable and viable. Your take. Africa, are we there? Are we sustainable? Are we viable? What's going on there? Um, I, I think, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think there's a lot of scope for us to, to grow in that regard. Um, the operating environment for airlines in Africa is quite challenging, and if not the most challenging uh, globally, in terms of the cost structure that our airlines in Africa are faced with. Um, the, we've got a, a regime or an environment where we operate in a, uh, with high charges and taxes that are imposed on, um, on, on airlines, on passengers. Um, and this has to be looked at in terms of improving the sustainability of, of the industry. Um, additionally, we also have charges on things like fuel and uh, infrastructure, we need to look at the infrastructure uh, that we are providing to enable the growth of the industry. So, yes, we, are, we do have room for growth in that regard to ensure that we achieve sustainability. Okay, so Dr. Bao, um, affordability, sustainability, you are the culprit, eh? You are the problem. <laughs> you are charging. You are charging these guys excessive fees, and they have no chance, they have no problem, they have no, op they have no option but to charge my constituents here, airfares that are higher. So how, how can you even start talking about 
sustainability and affordability when you, the regulator, are overcharging these people? I told you I would skewer you. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I think I would start by saying, uh, uh, Roger here, uh, for those who don't know, uh, in, South in Southern Africa, uh, Airlink connects us more than any other airlines. So he would know better that uh, uh, here in Botswana, from an aeronautical fee standpoint, we charge less than everybody around us. That is a fact. The data supports it. But it is an important Roger, point. don't answer that question. <laughs> it is an important thing to, to talk about because uh, if the fees are high, then sustainability becomes a problem. Uh, while uh, we as an authority, an airport operator, uh, indeed need to make enough to run the operation to make it easy for the airlines to transport you, supporting ourselves, supporting you. Uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that ultimately the charge gets passed on to the customer and that is restrictive. But I want to uh, throw something in, 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 in the discussion that has started regarding sustainability, which I believe it's, it's really very important. Uh, uh, Roger talked about uh, what had happened and how the airlines are, are some of the air, uh, airlines were not sustainable. When you look at our example here in Botswana, which may be the case in other African countries, which is something that I think we should critically look at. Uh, from a connectivity standpoint, my number one uh, uh, man is Roger. If something were to happen to Airlink, as it has happened to many other airlines during COVID, connectivity in Botswana would be a problem. We would be devastated. So when you look at sustainability as the different African countries, we also have to look at that. Look at how we are, who's connecting us, how many players are connecting us, and wonder and plan, uh, as Aaron talked about planning at the beginning, and plan for, for such eventualities that we want sustainable, sustainable airlines, but as a country, we need to have, a, we need to have plans. And I, say, I talk about this because I'm, I get worried about, about this. And I think many of us in Africa have to get worried about this. Honorable Deputy Minister, so you can see I'm trying to start a fight. Huh? Um, one of the things that I always advocate for is there is no such thing as um, elephants in the room. Elephants don't belong to the room. They belong to the zoo or to the national parks. So we are going to unpack this. From a ministerial point of view, three, three key issues, uh, uh, Honorable Minister. Policy, you make policy, right? Process, sits with this gentleman. And procedures, sit with Roger. What do you think you are not doing to support him and him? No, what are you not doing? No, thanks very much. No, we are doing everything to support everybody. We are doing all we can to, uh, to create an environment for business to, to do its, its, its business. But what, what you should understand is that uh, we are, as tourism, we are dependent on other departments. For example, the issue of the challenges of the lending fees which are very costly in Aha, that instances. gentleman there, right? Yes, him. A, our responsibility of transport, not tourism. Uh -huh. But we are engaging tourism to see how best do we improve the cost of lending, the fees. But secondly, you, for, for me, it will be important that this policy process, we must create national airlines and support national airlines as government so that we are able to create more frequent availability of airlines, which will then be able to compete with the private sector. And once you have got more competition and more airlines available, it enables uh, travelers to have choices, which choices then compels the, the competitors to be able to make sure that they compete and decrease the price and be able to ensure affordability 
at the end. Th th thank you, Deputy Minister. So, Roger, um, you, are, you, you are actually smiling, and I'm, I'm sure in your mind you are thinking, is it the sting of failure or the pang of what might have been with National Airlines? From your point of view, National Airlines, is there room for Air National Airlines? Yeah, uh, Aaron, as per usual, in your extremely diplomatic way, you yet again throw me under the bus. <laughs> Minister Fish, <laughs> I think governments have an absolute role in promoting competition. And I think that they need to fulfill that obligation and encourage competition as opposed to creating a playing field which is not level. And I think one has to find the balance. Uh, DG, I understand your concern about tourism uh, in a microcosm, in an ecosystem such as Botswana, being dependent wholly on a single carrier. And I've seen the word monopoly being bandied around quite a lot. And I can understand that concern. I think government's function is to enable competition and that does not necessarily mean the promotion of a national carrier uh, which is subsidized by the fiscus. And I think that that's where we've been wrong in the past. We've created unlevel playing fields which has dragged down a whole industry upon which tourism is totally dependent. Now, when it comes to Botswana tourism, I don't think Botswana tourism is totally dependent on Airlink as it stands at the moment, there is a national carrier and we compete. We compete in a collaborative way because in the event that either one of us, for whatever reason, drops the ball, the other one is there to make sure that our customers, our tourists, get to their destination as best as they possibly can. And I do believe that in the spirit of Saturn, the single African air transportation market, as countries liberalize, and to the greatest extent Botswana has done that, I believe there will be more and more carriers availing themselves of liberalization over time in a sustainable way on a level playing field and competition will materialize naturally. I do think what governments need to recognize, and I think, um, Aaron, you've, you've um, you know, touched on it quite comprehensively, we need to reduce and simplify air access. And it goes down to operators like Airlink and others do have barriers to entry. Uh, one of them is, why is it so difficult to organize foreign operators' permits? We have civil aviation authorities in Botswana, uh, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe. Some recognize that each other is already authorized by ICAO as a competent authority, but yet they still follow their own protocols when it comes to, and I'm not pointing fingers at Botswana or any other country, please, but they follow their own protocols when it comes to issuing a foreign operator's permit at enormous cost to the airline, at substantial administrative inconvenience to the airline. Why not just simplify that? We talk about, uh, I never get the number right, Aaron, because you're the teacher and I'm the student. So is it 54, 55, 52, 56, 57 <laughs> countries in Africa, each with their own set of regulations, competitions, legislation? Why can't we harmonize that? If we talk about Africa as a single continent, why don't we just recognize each of the civil aviation authorities as being competent authorities. And if an airline is issued an air operating certificate and it is designated to operate between two countries, accept it. Accept the protocols of that competent authority and let's get on with it. And stop raising charges which are unnecessary. We don't want those things because they become barriers to entry. Now I am pointing fingers at Botswana. So I'm going to lift the bus and take you out of uh, or under the bus. And I'm the one who's going to put him on the bus now. Uh, Mr. Driver, uh, these charges that you're talking about, um, making the playing field unlevel, um, you don't recognize other African, air, uh, African countries, CA, civil aviation authorities, and you still want to go and do inspections, and you are charging all kinds of uh, charges. Uh, Dr. Bauer, in your own personal opinion, 
not as CAA, in your own personal opinion, do you think this is making a case for Africa? Certainly not. And uh, I, I think uh, the discussion that uh, uh, Roger and I are, are probably going to have uh, on the side beyond this. But uh, I think the challenge that we have to look at uh, uh, as Africa comes down to, and uh, he, Roger that did talk about the fact that uh, countries, different authorities uh, and countries are uh, following ICAO standards. If we were all, as Africans, to live to the aspirations that we set uh, for ourselves, to increase safety, to increase security, so that our safety, uh, ICAO audit safety uh, scores are at a certain level, the goal which we have, it will make things so much easier. It will make reciprocity so much easier that when something is uh, accepted by an authority in another country, the other authority confidently accepted. If you look at, at where we sit in Africa, we have some countries who, whose effective implication, implementation of uh, uh, KO standards and recommended practice are in the 20s. And when you are a country, when you are a country that has worked hard to make sure that the aviation safety standards are at the highest level, it's, very, it's not easy for you to accept that. So I think at a fundamental level, we need to work hard as Africans to raise our EIs of uh, ICAO subs. Then it will be easier to very easily accept what each other is doing. At the moment, we have to be honest and say we are not yet confident of what others are doing because it's reflected in the score and the grading that we get out of ICAO. Uh, and I have to say that has to be our emphasis. And being here on behalf of Botswana to say in June of this year, we had the, the, uh, the audit from ICAO for safety and we did very, very well. The second part of it that I would also mention is, as we see, ICAO requires that uh, every country certify at least, the first step was every country should certify at least one international airport, and now we have graduated to every country has to certify all international airports. When you look at us in the African region, many of us have not done that. And I'm proud to say, as we sit here, starting on Monday, ending on Friday, the mission is on to certify Sasara Sakama Airport. So if we do that, if we certify our airport, if we increase our effective implementation of, of uh, safety standards, then we will, we will move our aviation industry up and it will be very easy for operators from one country to the other to easily be, uh, conduct business because as authorities will be confident on what the other authority in the other country is doing. Thank you. Okay, so, so uh, from what you are saying, I get it, I get your point. There is no such thing as overnight success. Yes. It's actually overnight exposure because you've been doing a lot of work in the background, right? Yes. Let me get this guy who is supposed to be neutral. So from your point of view, are these guys aligned? Um, are the charges that they are charging consistent? Are, are they uh, actually in alignment with what Roger needs to be able to fly my constituents here? Because I'm going to go to my constituents now and ask them what their thoughts are. But let me hear from you first. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think it, 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 that's a definite no. Um, they're not aligned, eh? They're, they're not aligned in terms of the charges, um, the charging levels. They're if overcharging. I got your, they're if overcharging. I got your question correct. They're overcharging, right? They're overcharging, let, right? Let me put they're it overcharging. This okay, good. Uh, cons constituency, <laughs> my constituency. Uh, let me ask you, so from your point of view, um, what do you, uh, you, I haven't even asked the question, you've got your hand up already. Wow, that's enthusiasm. So from your point of view as my constituency, uh, Roger is representing the airlines, not only his airline. Um, and he's saying the only way that he can save us, you and I, right? The only way he can save us is for the authorities to be able to charge as little as possible so that he can enable us to travel more. What are your thoughts? And, and you see, I'm a kind of different uh, moderator. I can see you are, love, you are smiling at me there. Uh, where is the microphone? Please give this lady the microphone so that she can answer my question. And now they stop, they stop smiling. 
They are not aligned. Uh, honorable minister. Uh -huh. No, no, no. I'm saying they are not answering, so they are not aligned with you. So. Oh, okay. And my, you see, my tender is about to be cancelled. She's here now to say that I've overran, over, overshot. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Please. I'm okay. I must, I must wrap it up. Uh -huh. Okay. So, madam, you have something, a question, eh? Or an answer? What are my thoughts on that? I think my thoughts, it should be vice versa. The regulators should really consider the charges. And I think the airlines, because I'm a travel agent, yes, they must reduce. Because I'm a travel agent, I know the content of um, a ticket, a ticket max. I can explain everything for you. So the um, regulators must reduce. But the airlines, too, must also meet them at some point. Because there are so many taxes in court that makes up a ticket that is not exactly from the regulator. That the airlines, till today, I ask that question. And they refuse to answer me. But this is not a ticket lecture. If you want a ticket lecture, I can give that. So we must both meet at the same point. Halfway. The airlines has to be honest. Halfway, halfway, halfway. Okay. Uh, because I, I also have a constituency here. Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, I've been given instructions in 30 seconds starting from now. Please can you just tell the audience how we are going to unblock this because we spoke about an intercontinental uh, um, organization that's going to put all of us together. How are you going to make this happen, sir? No, we, we have to make sure that we, we pull together uh, those bodies that are responsible to make sure that there is, inter, there is integration, there is inter-Africa tourism, we must not just come together as tourism alone. We must bring all the other sectors that contribute uh -huh. as a value chain right. towards making it easy and cheaper for tourists to be able to travel from one point to another then increase connectivity. Agree. Those That's people right. that issue visas, the minister, they are not here. Uh, Dr. Bao, so wait, wait, when are you going to reduce the, first, the charges? The, the charges that we, we talk about, uh, Roger is talking specifically about FOP. When you look at the fees in general, no, we no, are no. lower when than are you everybody. Going to, reduce? Uh, to reduce the FOPs, the charges. We are not reducing the charges, but we are prepared for a discussion you. about uh, FOPs. Roger, you see? He's, he's, he's not going to reduce the charges. What are you going to do about it? Uh, hello. No. Doctor and I are best friends. He's just reduced the FOP charges. We're happy. I think in every other dimension, we need to recognize that tourism in Botswana is not just tourism in Botswana. It's tourism in the region. Right. So if I have a look at the statistics, the facts behind it, we carry people from Cape Town to... Uh, wherever, Kasane. Uh, Okavango Swamps, yeah. Maun. We also carry people from Cape Town to Victoria Falls. We carry people from Cape Town to Wolfish Bay, to Vintook, to Etosha Pan. And the interesting thing is, if you take a look at inbound tourism, which is important for all of us in terms of stimulating the economy and creating jobs, not just for Botswana, but also for South Africa, Zimbabwe, Namibia, etc. What we've got to do is make sure that there is a free flow of air transportation between countries, between significant tourist destinations around here. And I think to enable that, the likes of foreign operators' permits should be automatically given. And Renewed all of the other charges, yes. well, I mean, for free, maybe there's an administrative charge that, that's got to be involved. I, I but agree. it shouldn't be the money-making the money device. The country should always look at inbound tourism brings revenue, Big creates picture. jobs. And that, I think, is in the long term everybody's common interest. Thank you. Wonderful. So, so Sandini, from your point of view, we're making life difficult for you, right? Um, no, no, I've found this quite enjoyable. Thank you. Um, I'll be quick and uh, short and quick. Countries that have signed SATAM must implement SATAM, make your bilateral air service agreements SATAM compliant, and through the RECs, which are the regional economic communities like SADAC, ECOWAS, implement what we call multilateral air service agreements to so ensure we implement of Bata, SATAM of Bata, immediately. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Roger, yes, one, just, but uh, my tender is not going to be cancelled, right? 
I, I wrap up. Roger has got something to say. You know he can upgrade me in business class. <laughs> okay, Roger. No, you just upgraded. Thank you very much. I, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder here, but I do want to emphasize one point that, uh, that Sandili has just raised right now, and that is that we can all sign SATAM. We can be signatories, but we have to walk the walk as well. Implement. And it goes about how do we see liberalization and do we see it the same? And what we are experiencing is that, you know, airlines that are domiciled in other parts of Africa wishing to gain access to markets through fifth freedom traffic rights. Now, that's a whole elaboration and explanation which I'm going to leave to you, Aaron, to explain. But when it comes to fifth freedoms, we're not seeing reciprocity. We're seeing barriers to entry in most of all countries, between countries in Africa, yet we're giving everything away down here. And I don't mean just in South Africa, I mean South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, etc. And I think what we've got to do is we've got to create that level playing field and make damn sure that nobody comes and eats our lunch. Your words. Thank you. Correct. So, uh, Tender Director, um, should I step down? Yes, okay. Um, you want to have a photograph, but not before I thank them, right? Honorable Deputy Minister, thank you very much for your input. Dr. Bao, Roger, and Sandile, thank you very much. I know I made life difficult for you, but that's what I'm paid to do. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Another round of applause for our panel, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the first part of our program. We are now going for a quick 15-minute grab-and-go refreshment break. That's a quick grab-and-go refreshment break. Please find food stations outside the main building on the ground that is to the left when heading out the main entrance. Please take your tags with you.